You don't have to be a big movie buff to have heard of the Keynes Film Festival, or just Keynes as many refer to it. Keynes kicked off just after World War II on September 20th, 1946. Each year, the invite-only film festival in Keynes, France, boasts a long list of celebrities as they watch some of the best films that year. A lot of movies even make their debut at that festival. That was true for the movie that we'll be looking at today, Grace of Monaco, when it kicked off the 2014 Keynes Festival. It wasn't in the running for competition, but at the time it was a highly anticipated film for many. With a budget of about $30 million, Grace of Monaco made its way into the headlines long before release. You see, the movie was supposed to come out before the 2014 Keynes Film Festival. After a couple years of production, it was slated for a 2013 release. But as the film was being edited, the director, Olivier de Haan, seemed to get into some sort of a fight with the movie's producer, Harvey Weinstein. Well, not a physical fight in that, you know, punches and stuff were being thrown, but in a kind of blackmailing sort of way. At least, that's what Olivier said when he publicly said this to The Guardian in October of 2013. And I'll warn you, there is a swear word in here. Quote, it's right to struggle, but when you confront an American distributor like Weinstein, not to name names, there's not much you can do. Either you say, go figure it out with your pile of shit, or you brace yourself so the blackmail isn't as violent. If I don't sign, that's where the out-and-out -out blackmail starts. But I could go that far. There are two versions of the film for now, mine and his, which I find catastrophic. It's got hardly anything to do with the film. It's only about the money, the release strategy, millions of dollars and stuff like that. It's got nothing to do with cinema. I mean, of course it's about cinema, but the business side. They want a commercial film smelling of daisies, taking out anything that exceeds that which is too abrupt, everything that makes it cinematic and breathe with life. A lot of things are missing. End quote. So... I think it's safe to say that Olivier wasn't too happy with the cut of the film that Harvey Weinstein seemed to be pushing. However, it was apparently Olivier's editorial cut that debuted at Cannes in 2014. We'll never really know how much of that had an effect on the final film, but the movie that was released came back with less than stellar reviews. I'll make sure to put a link to that article in The Guardian and plenty more of those reviews in the show notes over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. But perhaps the most scathing review for the movie came from Grace Kelly's son, Prince Albert II of Monaco, who, among other things, stated that the filmmakers ignored their requests for changes to the script and ultimately denounced the film, saying in a statement, quote, Therefore, the royal family wishes to stress that this film in no way constitutes a biopic, end quote. All of that was before the movie was even released and resulted in the royal family refusing to attend the movie's premiere at the 2014 Keynes Film Festival, despite usually being attending members at the festival. With all of this controversy before the film was even released, that begs the question, just how accurate is Grace of Monaco? I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is Based on a True Story. Before we learn about Grace of Monaco, it's time for two truths and a lie. Now, if you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'll give you three facts. Two of them are true, and one of them is a lie. Okay, here they are. Number one, Grace Kelly continued to act in Hollywood films after becoming the Princess of Monaco. Number two, the French did put up a blockade during the tensions between France and Monaco. Number three, the House of Grimaldi's reign over Monaco began in 1297. Listen closely for the two truths scattered throughout the episode, then by a process of elimination, you'll know which one is a lie. And, of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. By the way, do you have your own Based on a True Story stickers yet? They're completely free. I'll send you a sticker when you subscribe, rate, and review the show, and send me an email with the screenshot of your review. I need that email to be able to get back in touch with you privately to get your address or an address to send the sticker to. If you're driving or can't do it at this moment, no problem. Check out basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash giveaway to get all the details. And with that, let's compare history with Hollywood's version of 
Grace of Monaco. It seems that despite, or maybe because of, all of the controversy before the movie was even released, the filmmakers decided not to go with the traditional based on a true storyline. Instead, the movie opens with some text that says the following film is a fictional account inspired by real events. Not a very promising start. Nor is the quote we see next, which says, The idea of my life as a fairy tale is itself a fairy tale. As far as I can tell, everyone seems to agree that is a quote from the real Grace Kelly. However, there's not a lot of ways to prove this. By that, what I mean is, quotes are one of those things that are next to impossible to prove sometimes. There's so many misattributed quotes, and it's not like everyone issues some sort of documentation for the things that they say each and every day. It makes it a little tough to validate sometimes. Unless, of course, it's caught on audio or video in some way, so we can all point back to it. And it seemed that this quote is not so easily validated, so we're not off to a great start here. Going back to the movie, it's the first time we see Nicole Kidman's portrayal of Grace Kelly on screen, and we see her as a movie is coming to an end. The movie never really says what film is wrapping up on screen, but all we hear is, cut, that's a wrap from the director, and everyone seems to be super happy with Grace's performance as she drifts through a crew to what we can only assume is a trailer, or maybe it's not a trailer because it doesn't really seem to look like one, but it's one fluid shot, so she's going from the set to somewhere else. It's in here, wherever that is, that the movie sets up a bit of the backstory. We're in Los Angeles in 1956, and according to an announcer on TV, or maybe it's radio. We don't really see where the voice is coming from. The announcer explains that Philadelphia-born actress Grace Kelly married Prince Rainier III of Monaco after a chance meeting at the Cannes Film Festival ended up with the two getting married. All of that is true, but there's quite a bit more to the story here. Let's start with the movie that we see Nicole Kidman's version of Grace Kelly acting in during the opening sequence. In 1956, the real Grace Kelly starred in two different movies. One of them was The Swan and the other High Society. Even though the movie doesn't mention which one we're seeing here, we can guess that it's High Society because that was Grace Kelly's final film, a film that saw her star alongside musicians such as Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, and Louis Armstrong. And it is true that Grace Kelly married Prince Rainier III of Monaco after meeting him at the Cannes Film Festival. Well, sort of. Grace Kelly was in Cannes, France for the internationally renowned film festival in 1955. Grace was, at the time, already one of the biggest stars in Hollywood thanks to her Oscar win for her performance in the 1954 film The Country Girl. That's one of the films competing in the festival that year, and so that's why Grace Kelly was in town. While in Cannes, Grace Kelly agreed to take a photo with Prince Rainier for a magazine called Paris Match. That photo shoot was something set up as a last-minute idea by another Oscar-winning actress named Olivia de Havilland. According to Olivia, who recounted the story to People magazine many years later, her husband worked as an editor for Paris Match, and with Grace Kelly in town, she thought it would be a great chance for a photo opportunity. She picked Prince Rainier because her husband had connections in Monaco. Now, for a bit of geography, Monaco is located only about 34 miles, or about 55 kilometers, to the northeast, up the coast from Cannes. Between Cannes and Monaco is Nice, France, and that's where Olivia's husband was born and raised. So, as Olivia told it, the meeting was really a last-minute meetup that Grace agreed to do as long as MGM Studios, the company financing her trip, agreed to do it. They did, and that's how Prince Rainier III met Grace Kelly. Although, while the movie seems to imply it was love at first sight, and it very well might have been, there's one important fact the movie fails to mention. That's the simple fact that Prince Rainier was looking for someone to continue the royal line. He was actively looking for a wife. To understand why, we have to dive 37 years further back into history to the year 1918. If you're a student of history, you'll know that it was in 1918 when World War I came to an end. 
That was on November 11th, 1918. But for the purposes of our story, it all has to do with the succession of the royal line in Monaco. With the end of the war imminent, the French government had a problem with the line of succession in Monaco. The problem, in the eyes of the French, was that the current ruler in Monaco, Prince Albert I, was just a couple days away from his 70th birthday at the end of World War I. So it was only a matter of time before his successor would take the throne. The issue with that was that his son, Prince Louis II, was about 48 years old when World War I came to a close, and he had no wife, no children, and no prospects. That would mean if something didn't change after both Prince Albert I and Prince Louis II passed, the throne of Monaco would go to Wilhelm, the second Duke of Urech. Although Wilhelm was born in Monaco, he lived in Württemberg. In fact, you might have seen pictures of his castle online, Liechtenstein Castle in Württemberg. It's often referred to as a fairy tale castle, and when you see pictures of it, you'll see why. I'll make sure to include some of those on my Instagram feed over at Based on a True Story Podcast. Wilhelm's place of residence was an issue for France because Württemberg became a part of the German Empire in 1871. Remember that Monaco is located along the southern French coast, so you can imagine why the French wouldn't want someone with ties to Germany being a ruler on their southern border. On the other hand, Monaco was almost entirely beholden to France. I think there's a couple points in the movie that imply this, but it's completely true that Monaco themselves don't really produce anything. Because of their small size, Monaco is only about two square kilometers. That's less than one square mile in size. They don't really have room for things like growing crops. So almost everything comes from France, which borders Monaco on all sides that aren't the Mediterranean Sea. In July of 1918, Prince Albert I traveled to Paris to sign a treaty that essentially meant if the royal dynasty would end, then Monaco would become an autonomous state under French protection. It also gave France the power to approve or disapprove Monegasque sovereignty. Basically, France could say no to Wilhelm taking over. This is the official line of text from the treaty, and just so you know, the term principality is referring to the official designation of Monaco as a principality, basically a city-state. Measures concerning the international relations of the principality shall always be the subject of prior consultations between the government of the principality and the French government. The same shall apply to measures concerning directly or indirectly the exercise of a regency or succession to the throne, which shall, whether by marriage or adoption or otherwise, pass only to a person who is of French or Monegasque nationality and is approved by the French government. Still, Prince Louis did end up having a daughter by the name of Charlotte. Her mother was a woman named Marie-Juliette Louvet and was a laundress of Prince Louis II's regiment in the French army. As you can probably guess, the two weren't married, but Louis II officially recognized Charlotte as his daughter, and on May 15, 1911, Charlotte was officially admitted into the Grimaldi dynasty. If you've been paying attention to the timeline here, that's before the treaty that we just learned about with the French. So that gives you an idea of how certain the French were of the stability of the Grimaldi dynasty, even with Charlotte. Oh, and the House of Grimaldi is the surname for the royal family of Monaco. So Prince Louis' last name was Grimaldi, same with Prince Renier in the movie. Charlotte, now the Monegasque hereditary princess, married Pierre the Duke of Valentinois, making him Prince Pierre of Monaco. Their son was Renier. When he turned 21 in 1944, Charlotte renounced her claim to the throne so Renier could become the direct heir to the throne. So, when Prince Louis passed away on May 9, 1949, just five years later, the throne didn't pass to Charlotte, but instead passed to Prince Renier III. And with that brief history, we have a better idea of why Prince Renier III, who's played by Tim Roth in the film, was trying to find a wife. Since they were still bound by the Treaty of 1918, if Prince Renier III couldn't maintain the royal line, Monaco's succession would be held up in the air. And there could be a good chance that the French would simply absorb Monaco, take the opportunity. 
While there's no way to know for sure if that would have happened, it's not like Prince Rainier wanted to find out. So he was on the lookout, but that doesn't necessarily mean Grace Kelly was his ideal candidate for a wife. I say candidate like she's applying for a position. It was a marriage, so love certainly was involved, but it was also a position. Being the princess for a throne that didn't have an heir meant it was up to Prince Rainier to make sure that his future wife would be able to provide an heir, if he wanted the dynasty to continue. There are some historians who believe that Prince Rainier subjected Grace Kelly to tests by doctors to ensure she could bear children before they were married. Tests that Grace certainly agreed to do, but if nothing else, all of this evidence suggests that it wasn't only love. It was clear that succession was on Prince Rainier's mind at the time. That leads us to the next little bit in the movie where, according to the movie, the marriage between Prince Rainier III of Monaco and Grace Kelly becomes the century's biggest wedding in the world's smallest state. Now, I think we can give the movie a bit of a pass here because that's clearly very opinionated. It's still worth pointing out that there's been a lot of big weddings that get referred to as the wedding of the century. Some of those were royal weddings. For example, Charles, Prince of Wales, married Lady Diana Spencer in 1981. But it certainly is true that at the time, the wedding between Prince Rainier III and Grace Kelly was a big deal. It was reported by media around the world as Grace Kelly transitioned from Hollywood royalty to actual royalty. So, yeah, the wedding was a big deal. But what about the movie's claim that it was happening in the world's smallest state. Well, Monaco is certainly small. As we learned earlier, it takes up about less than one square mile or about two square kilometers. But that makes it the world's second smallest state, with the Vatican undercutting it at only 0.17 square miles or about 0.44 square kilometers. The next major plot point in the film happens, according to the movie, in December of 1961, when Alfred Hitchcock arrives in Monaco to deliver the script for a movie called Marnie, he offers Grace the lead role, thereby spinning a major conflict in the film. Should she return to the silver screen as Grace Kelly, the Oscar-winning actress? Or should she turn away from Hollywood and devote herself fully to being Her Serene Highness, the Princess of Monaco? While there are elements of truth in this, it seemed like a lot of the details here were fictionalized for the film. What is true is that Grace Kelly was offered a role in the Alfred Hitchcock movie Marnie. But some historians suggest the reason for Princess Grace of Monaco's turning down the role were quite different than the movie makes it seem. While it is true Alfred Hitchcock traveled to Monaco to offer the role, of course, we don't know a lot of what happened behind closed doors at the palace in Monaco. So we don't know a lot of what the real Grace Kelly was thinking at the time. According to Patricia Hitchcock, Alfred's daughter, she recalled that both her father and mother went to Monaco to pitch the script to Princess Grace, who, along with Prince Rainier, were both friends of the Hitchcocks. In the documentary called The Trouble with Marnie, Patricia went on to explain that Grace was tempted by the offer. Now, in his book called Writing with Hitchcock, the collaboration of Alfred Hitchcock and John Michael Hayes, author Stephen DeRosa explained a few other reasons why Grace Kelly might not have accepted the role. First, the movie is correct in stating that Marnie was being distributed by Universal Pictures. But Grace Kelly was under contract with MGM Studios, and because she got married so quickly, she apparently didn't finish off her contract with MGM. So if she was to return to Hollywood, she likely wouldn't have even been able to star in a Universal movie without plenty of legal work first. But even more than that, the Monegasque people didn't seem to be too fond of the idea of their princess starring in a role where she'd have to be playing, well, what some reviews of the film would end up referring to as a sexually disturbed thief. That probably wouldn't paint Monaco in a very good light with the rest of the world. Going back to the movie, this brings up the next major plot point, taxes in Monaco. According to the film, Monaco doesn't tax their residents, and France's president, Charles de Gaulle, is putting pressure on Prince Rainier III to start doing that. There's also a few mentions of an increase in businesses in Monaco in the movie, although briefly. 
bits and pieces of that are true, but there's more to the story that the movie doesn't mention than the bits and pieces that it does. We don't really know what the treasury was like for Monaco when Renier took over the throne, but a lot of people believe it was, well, not too great. The country wasn't doing so well financially, basically. Because Monaco doesn't really have anything to export, in 1863, Prince Charles III built a casino in Monte Carlo. That casino grew over the decades, and again, we don't really have documentation of exactly how much the casino pulls in, but many people believe that was Monaco's primary source of income. All of that changed when World War I hit, and again, when World War II hit. The two wars, essentially back-to-back, really hurt the casino. Not many people in Europe had extra spending money to gamble after their funds were depleted from the war. When Prince Rainier III took the throne, some historians have estimated that gambling accounted for about 95% of Monaco's income. But on the heels of the war, that income wasn't doing so well. So Rainier had a brilliant idea for how to bring more money into the country without relying on the casino. To do that, he put steps in place to turn Monaco into both a tourist destination and a tax haven, the latter of which attracted a ton of businesses to Monaco in an effort to, well, avoid having to pay taxes. This is kind of the same sort of thing that a lot of countries and cities do even today. For example, in the past few decades, Vancouver, Canada has lured a lot of feature film visual effects companies to their city thanks to favorable tax laws for that industry. Of course, they still have to pay taxes. Those are just tax benefits. In the case of Monaco, the benefit was not having to pay tax at all. And as we learned earlier, since Monaco was almost completely surrounded by France, that meant a lot of the businesses who set up shop in Monaco came from France. Essentially, it was legal tax evasion. And as you can probably guess, it didn't make France too happy. All of a sudden, they lost a bunch of tax dollars. Well, not all of a sudden. It wasn't something that just happened overnight. But over the span of just a few years since Prince Rania III took the throne until the events in the movie, more and more businesses took advantage of the tax haven bordering France. As a little side note, if you've heard of the Cayman Islands and how many of the world's richest people use the Caymans as a way of evading taxes, that's basically what Monaco was for many of Europe's richest people. Something else the movie suggests through various conversations we hear is that the French are at war in Africa. So, in turn, they're putting pressure on Monaco to match French taxes so businesses wouldn't leave France and they'd be able to help fund the war. At least, that's the story according to the movie. And again, there is some truth in that. The movie doesn't really mention what the war is other than saying it's in Africa, But looking at history, we can assume the film is referring to the Algerian War, which spanned over seven years from November of 1954 to March of 1962. While tensions between France and Monaco really did start to heat up in 1959, it was mostly because of something the movie doesn't even mention, when Prince Rainier III decided to suspend part of Monaco's constitution. That, in turn, happened because of something the movie doesn't really focus on at all. I'm referring to the power struggle of sorts between Prince Rainier III and one of the world's wealthiest men at the time, Aristotle Onassis. His name might ring a bell even if you haven't heard of him. His first name, for obvious reasons, everyone knows who the Greek philosopher Aristotle was. Well, Aristotle's first name probably sounds familiar. If Aristotle Onassis' last name sounds familiar, it's probably because you might have heard of Jackie Onassis. Aristotle married Jackie Kennedy in 1968, about five years after her husband, the President of the United States, was assassinated. Aristotle, who does have a part in the movie as he's played by Robert Lindsay, owned a shipping business. He had made his way to Monaco before Prince Rainier III took the throne and invested in the Société de Ben de Mer de Monaco. And I'm sure I butchered that, so we'll just call it by its initials. SBM. SBM is the publicly traded company that runs the casino in Monte Carlo and three of the biggest resorts on Monaco. By the time Prince Rainier took the throne, Aristotle was already a major investor. With the prince having a similar vision for Monaco, the two couldn't really seem to get along. It was a power struggle that found its way into the public eye when something happened that was the inspiration for something else in the film. 
By that, I'm referring to the big ending in the movie where we see the plot with the traitor, Princess Antoinette. She's played by Geraldine Somerville in the film. And according to the movie, she and Jean-Charles Ray team up to conspire against the prince. Jean-Charles Ray is played by Nicholas Farrell in the film. While there certainly could have been some dealings with the French, in reality, the tension between Renier and the French started to peak after Renier hit his breaking point on a different front. I'm referring to when Princess Antoinette, who really was Renier's older sister, sided with Aristotle Onassis to publicly oppose Renier's plan to build a lab. That lab was for one of his friends, Jacques Cousteau, who had recently become the director of the Oceanographic Museum of Monaco in 1957. And that was the last straw for Renier, who was already at odds with Aristotle. On January 29, 1959, he made an announcement via radio that he wouldn't tolerate the attempts to undermine his rights anymore. He decided to suspend the Constitution and dissolve the National Council, the council that Aristotle was on, which had opposed his laboratory. That escalated tensions with France, who already were not happy with the lack of taxes in Monaco. Getting rid of the Constitution, or even just parts of it as some reports claim, didn't make that relationship better. So it is true that the French president, Charles de Gaulle, applied pressure on Monaco because of taxes. Things just didn't quite happen the way that we saw in the film, or for the reasons that we saw in the film. There's even some truth to the blockade we saw the French set up in the movie. But that blockade was set up in October of 1962, while, as we just learned, the French-Algerian War ended in March of that same year. So while the events are true, the filmmakers shifted things around a bit for their narrative. Speaking of the blockade, that too was adjusted for the narrative. By that, what I mean is, it wasn't nearly as big of a deal as the movie made it seem. In the film, what looks like... Spikes are laid down across the road to pop anyone's tires who try to leave, soldiers or police officers of some sort, and they even have some barbed wire there. According to the October 13, 1962 edition of the French newspaper Le Monde, a blockade was set up that seemed to be more of a prank. There were only six customs officials from France who blocked the road between Monaco and Nice, And while it did cause traffic jams, there was no mention of barbed wires or spiking tires. The final scene in the movie is at a gala where Nicole Kidman's version of Princess Grace has a very emotional speech. At the end, the American Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, turns to President de Gaulle and says something to the effect of, You wouldn't bomb Grace, would you, Charles? None of that is true. Well, most of it isn't true. It is true that the Red Cross holds an annual ball in Monaco. Some of the big names who have performed in previous years were Ella Fitzgerald in 1959, Sammy Davis Jr. in 1961, and not to get too far ahead of our story, but Frank Sinatra in 1980, Elton John in 1984, and so on. So some big names. But for the 1962 ball, which saw Charles Trenet performing, Charles de Gaulle, the president of France, was not in attendance like the movie shows. There's also no evidence that suggests Princess Grace had any sort of sway on the resolution of the tensions between France and Monaco. In truth, in true political fashion, it's much less interesting. Really, it was a compromise between France and Monaco that allowed French citizens who lived in Monaco for less than five years to be subject to taxation by the French government. Basically, they couldn't just run to Monaco to avoid being taxed. That's a big deal because... At least as of 2014, about 30% of the citizens in Monaco are millionaires. I realize that's not 1962 numbers, but I couldn't find the number of millionaires in Monaco in 1962. I'd venture to guess that it was a lot. Maybe not 30%, but it doesn't have to be that high in order to be a lot of tax money. At the very end of the movie, there's a bit of text on screen that says, Grace Kelly never acted again. And that's true. Grace Kelly's acting career started in 1950 and ended in 1956 after she married Prince Renier. Despite only being active for six years, she received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame on February 8, 1960. On September 14, 1982, Princess Grace was driving in Monaco when she suffered a stroke, lost control of the car, and crashed. She never recovered. She was only 52. 
Prince René III, never remarried and continued to rule in Monaco until he passed away on April 6, 2005. He was 81. His death was overshadowed in Europe at the time by the news of Pope John Paul II's death just four days earlier. At the time of his death, Prince Rainier was the longest reigning monarch in Europe at 56 years from Europe's longest ruling royal family. The movie was correct in giving the year 1297 when the House of Grimaldi took over control in Monaco. After Rainier passed away, his and Princess Grace's son, Prince Albert II, took the throne. Before he passed away, though, in 2002, Monaco's constitution was amended to change the succession laws. Even if Prince Albert didn't have an heir, the Grimaldi family would stay on the throne. In 2011, Prince Albert followed in his father's footsteps by marrying a star from another country. This time, it was the former Olympic swimmer from South Africa, Charlene Whitstock. Since then, the couple has had a set of twins, ensuring that the Grimaldi family will reign for yet another generation in Monaco. Then it was just last year that Prince Albert II spent $754,000 buying the childhood home of his mother, Grace Kelly, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. Ultimately, Grace of Monaco lives up to the text at the beginning of the movie when it claims to be a fictional account inspired by real events. Maybe more the former than the latter. But Princess Grace's life was truly a fascinating one that's definitely worth learning more about. There's a lot of great books out there, but if you're looking for a place to start, I would recommend either My Days with Princess Grace of Monaco by Joan Dale, High Society, The Life of Grace Kelly by Donald Spoto, or the book simply called Grace Kelly by James Spada. I'll add links to those books and plenty more resources to begin your deep dive into the life of Grace Kelly over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Before we get to the answer to our two truths and a lie game, here's another five-star review. This one comes from History Goes Bump over on Apple Podcasts and says, Unique and Wonderful. I've often wondered when I watch a movie that claims to be based on a true story just how accurate that claim truly is, and Dan answers that question. He does extensive research and fills in the holes or reveals what actually happened and what Hollywood has taken liberties with. He does this in an engaging and entertaining way, and the production is amazing. I also love the opening segment that requires listener comprehension, two true statements and one false statement about the topic you have to figure out which one is false. Very fun. Highly recommend. Thanks so much. I've mentioned History Goes Bump before, but if you haven't checked out Diane and Denise's podcast, I'd really recommend you do so. It's a fun and educational podcast all about, well, just like what the name implies, paranormal-themed historical places and events. Thanks so much for the review. Okay, and as they mentioned in the review, it's time now for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. Here is a refresher on those two truths and one lie. Number one, Grace Kelly continued to act in Hollywood films after becoming the Princess of Monaco. Number two, the French did put up a blockade during the tensions between France and Monaco. Number three, the House of Grimaldi's reign over Monaco began in 1297. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is number one. 1956 marked the final year an original Grace Kelly film would be released when The Swan and then High Society were released. After marrying Prince Rainier III in 1958, she'd never return to the big screen again. Have you done more research into Grace Kelly's amazing life? Why not join the Base on a True Story Facebook group and share it with the community? Oh, and don't forget, you can pick up your own Base on a True Story t-shirts and merch over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash merch. You can also follow the show on Instagram. It's at based on a true story podcast, where I like to post some photos of the faces and places behind each episode of the podcast. You can also find me on Twitter where I'm at Dan Lefebvre, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. Or if social media isn't your thing, you can shoot me a good old fashioned email at dan at based on a true story podcast.com. Thanks 
so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.